Welcome to Inside the Barrel, Episode 7, where we're going to talk with a special guest about CSM and kind of behind the scenes of, you know, working as an architect or a platform engineer um, and getting that consulting mindset. So today, John and I are have a lovely host of Brian with us. And so Brian, you want to give a little chat about yourself and tell the guests, you know, what you do at CASC. Yeah, thanks, Doreen. It's uh, great being here with you and John. Um, uh, I'm Brian Wills. I'm our CSM technical practice lead here at CASC. So um, I get to deal with all of our CSM implementations, uh, make sure that we're doing things in the right way and really teaching people what CSM and what it's not, I guess. So um, excited to, to dive in. Awesome, yeah, and before we get started, John and I like to throw questions out there. Um, I, I told you some sample questions before, so I had to change it on the fly. But are you more of a Gatorade or water person? I am more of a water person. Mm, but Gatorade is better. I, I like Propel. <laughs> oh, throw, throwing that out there. What about vitamin water? Come on, we no. got to give 50 Cent a shout out. No. Yeah, no, I'm a more of a LaCroix person. Oh. Yeah, I know. We got we got fancy with us. All right. Cool. So, um, so let's kind of talk a little bit about overview of CSM and you know what is CSM and then we'll kind of dive into the the instance. So Brian, you want to give us a quick what is and what isn't CSM? Yeah, so um it's probably one of the toughest questions, not toughest, most often asked question and wrong question um, ever answered. And CSM is not external ITSM. It is actually customer service management. Um, as um, John is Googling customer service management for ServiceNow. <laughs> um, and there's also different personas that people don't realize what actually fits into CSM. So um, just because it's um, external, that could be external to IT as well. Um, so really looking through um, requests that actually serve your customer. So it could be a product that they buy entitlements um, and then really walking them through um, resolution versus like your standard ITSM where it's, it's break fix um, mm -hmm. and that kind of um, capability. But um, I, I think it'll probably make sense as we kind of walk through it um, as John's showing the different modules within CSM. Um, you can kind of see how it really differs from ITSM. It's not, um, it's meant for, for a user experience. And um, the, big, the big thing to call out on CSM is um, you really need to use Agent Workspace. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna call that one out right away. Please don't, don't you do CSM without Agent Workspace because it's a horrible experience. And um, I've seen how, uh, awful it is to to manage yeah and so what does what does like customer mean in in, in this case right like how do, does service now like provide support for different types of customers or different industries like could you can you kind of talk about that yeah they came out with um the different industry data models um recently in quebec they added some more um, so it's really giving you granular um, abilities to separate your users. So your user could be one, a, a business. So um, let's say we provide a service to um, another business as like CAS is consulting. So that'd be a business to business or business to consumer. So you can even have like households um, calling in. So example, your power company, and you are a customer of your power company. Um, and then those data models allow you to build um, things like households and consumer records, and you can build those relationships um, with 
uh, other people in your household. And, and it really uh, splits out the data in a way that it, it's actually manageable um, so that you can actually provide services for your customers versus um, in your ITSM world, it's just users, right? Um, it, it goes way deeper and, and it's way more impactful that way. Awesome. So John and I like to just dive in and break stuff or figure stuff out as we go. So let's kind of like go in. So in this one, we normally use um, Cask Demo 12, right, for, for this, but we wanted to, since we may be installing new things, we wanted to make sure we had a fresh PEI. Um, so yesterday I cheated John and I installed CSM on this. It took about 30 minutes, so an out of the box uh, install took 30 minutes just to get CSM installed as a plugin. Um, so I would, the first thing I would mention to people is like, make sure you're doing this on a, like on a downtime, right? Because there's a lot of things that are going on when, when you install CSM. So don't try to install CSM during the middle of the day, like definitely plan a weekend or an evening or an early morning. Um, uh, because there's all the it turns on something like called the contextual security plugin, um, which changes a lot of your users and roles. Um, so just kind of be mindful of the first thing when you turn on. Don't just rush to turn it on. Like definitely have a plan for it. Yeah, I would say if you actually look at the plugin, it 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 adds a lot. I think there's like almost like twenty five or thirty of them. So. Yeah, you, you need to know what you're getting into when you're turning that on. Um, uh, it, it also, if you're not um, keeping track of, of what you're doing, it, it also can provide risk to you if you um, turn it on and uh, aren't, aren't configuring it um, how you should be. Yeah, especially I know there's this like, when you turn it on, it, it adds new roles to every user in your system. So you definitely want to be smart about that because if you're not ready for that, it may give people access that they didn't expect. Um, so something to keep in mind, like the first thing that I remember doing with CSM is like understanding the roles and understanding the impact to the essentially the user table. Um, and so let's, uh, John, let's dive into, let, let's look at that user table first. So just pretty much go to users and just click on a user. So when you turn on CSM, the, the first thing that you're going to notice that's different is you'll see roles here on the bottom that every single user in your system will get this role. Um, SNC internal, as opposed to there's another one called SNC external. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, that internal role essentially gives them access to the fulfiller view. It doesn't give them access to all of the IT stuff you were doing or incident or things like that, but it gives them access to essentially this this backend view of ServiceNow. Um, any... I would say that is one that is like the number one thing when you're when you're doing your checks is is make sure you have your SNC internal and externals. You didn't mess with it to to mess that up um, because it's normally not good if you do because um, that's what a lot of stuff is driven from on the consumer portal. Yeah, and I know that ServiceNow doesn't let you have both of them, so you have to make a decision. And so that's why planning is important to make a decision on whether someone's an internal or external. Um, cool, so the other thing that is more of a, just a gotcha, if you create a new user, um, we're gonna, before John creates it, do we think they're gonna get the internal or external role when you press new user up there? I'm gonna let John internal. answer this one. I'm gonna go with internal. <laughs> okay, so try it. <laughs> So the, the answer is they're actually not going to get any role. So when you manually create a user, um, even though the, the plugin is turned on, they're not going to get a role. Um, and that's because the business rules don't um, always run when you, when you create them. But oh, oh, I could be wrong too, but no, I'm correct. Yeah. <laughs> So this is also something to be careful of, right? So every 
pretty much once you get into the CSM space, every single user needs to have a role. So someone at, at some level will need to have SNC internal or external. There are other roles that CSM essentially manages or installs um, that you, you do want for your users, but at a bare minimum um, for them to count towards licensing, to, to get access to something in the system, they'll need to have at least SNC internal or external. So some another gotcha to kind of keep in mind when when you're if you manually create users most people don't they link it with ldap and then you'll have transform maps and then you'll you'll manage um that differently right but if you ever if you still do use internal login you just got to make sure that you give them the right role or essentially put them in the right group because normally that's how you would you would manage something like that um Cool. Anything else about sys user, Brian, you think that you want to kind of bring up? If things are going wonky, <laughs> and wonky is a very interesting term, make sure you have your SNC internal or external on the users. You'd be surprised how many times um, something isn't right with that, and you're not getting it, and it just it doesn't work. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. Um, the Kind of the next thing... Um, that I like to talk about with CSM is around the um, extension of the user table. So it's so very oh. similar to uh, if you've ever worked in HR. HR essentially has these HR profiles, um, and HR profiles are essentially just an extension of the sys user table, um, and they co contain extra information on it. So. Um, similarly, in CSM, there's, uh, I would say, three extra tables that are very interesting. Um, the CSM consumer, the CS CSM consumer user, and uh, customer, or I guess four, uh, customer account, and then customer contact. So those are kind of the four tables. Um, and I think I got them all that are like the baseline, Brian. You did. Cool. So um, if, if John wants to go on the left hand side and just type in consumer. So we'll talk about consumers. And so Brian, what, what's a consumer? <laughs> consumer is normally like an individual uh, and it's not a business, right? So John is a consumer of LaCroix. Uh, <laughs> Brian yes. is a consumer of LaCroix. <laughs> Yeah. So it's someone that like, you know, potentially buys products or it's really just like, as you said, like that individual. So if you sell things or let's say um, you work with uh, an organization, another organization that, yeah, I think it's more of if like you sell something or your citizens or your, 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 your somebody you offer services to at an individual level. Um, that's what consumer is. And so e kind of, oh, easiest really. way to describe that is a widget. You buy a widget and you own the widget. You're now a consumer of that widget. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what, what John's showing right now is actually on that CSM consumer table that I mentioned. Um, and there's, there's two key things here. One, there's business rules that run on this to sync data. Um, so just keep that in mind. But two, this is like what I like to call the, um, like the consumer profile. Um, this is not related to their login. This is just information about them. So if, you, if you're coming from the HR space, this is like your HR profile. Um, this doesn't control login. This just controls information about that consumer. But notice there's a tab here that says login details. And so login details has the ability to um, attach a profile or what I'm calling a profile to that. And so that is based on, I'm assuming when John opened it up, he didn't see anybody, right? He didn't see, he saw blank users. Uh, yeah, I, I, there are no users that. though. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. Um, yeah, and so the reason for that is because there's another table that extends the sys user table called CSM consumer user. So if John wants to go directly to to con CSM underscore consumer underscore user dot list, 
So the reason when he clicked that uh, user it was blank is because none of them exist. And so this is where you manage the login for your consumers. So what's nice about this different uh, differentiation is you could have people that email you that don't have logins, people that um, you, you like on the fly walk in and you want to collect some basic information about them, but you don't have to give them login to your actual system. So if you need to provide login, this is where you create that uh, consumer uh, consumer user, and this is what extends sys user table. So you'll you'll kind of notice this like looks very similar to creating a sys user um, from the the back end um, uh, on the sys user table. There's a class uh, field, and the class field shows you that it can be either a user or a consumer user. Um, just... And they they do expose this uh, out of box UI action in um, in workspace to create consumers mm. on the fly. Cool. And but does that create that doesn't create the login that just creates their it, profile, right? Yes, correct. Cool. Just their profile. Yeah, and so so that kind of it so that kind of brings me to like when you're importing let's say you have consumer users when you're importing them like which table do you actually import them into um do you do you import them into the profile one that i'm referring to or do you per, per, uh, import them into the consumer user oh a question for me i i, I can answer <laughs> it i um so about <laughs> Uh, I I don't know. I would um, obviously you you put it into the um, you have to create their profile first before you create their user account. Yeah. Um, so you import into the profile and then you connect the the accounts. Yeah, and so just kind of keep that in mind. Is this person that you're importing going to need to log in, um, or are they just sending emails, or they're just sending phone calls? Right, like those are kind of the that that differentiation that I like to think of is like if they need to log in, all right, we created the profile and we need to create their consumer user. Um, if they don't need to log in, then the, you stop at the profile and you don't need to create that consumer user. So, so yeah. keep that in mind. Yeah, you got to make that decision. <laughs> That's what I was, I was a little curious where we're going with that one, but yeah. Um, cool. So then, so that's kind of the consumer world. So when Brian mentioned in the beginning, there was, you know, different, um, different types of customers or what is a customer. They also have this notion of contacts. Um, so if you want to, yeah, perfect. So contacts are uh, a different table, <laughs> customer contacts. Um, and these are based on um, this also extends this user, um, but these are used for an account contact structure. Um, so essentially what that means is if you have a customer that's like a business, like let's say a dealership or um, you know a partner or something like that that is external, then you essentially create these accounts and then these accounts have contacts. And so um, an example, if you go, if you go to the accounts uh, underneath, right above, con yeah, sure. <laughs> yep, and so, and, and so you may ask yourself, well, why do I need to do this? Why is this important? Why do I need to differentiate between consumers and contacts? That just sounds like a lot of work. Um, ServiceNow kind of provides some out of the box experiences for whether someone is uh, a contact in an account versus just a consumer. So an example of that would be if you wanted to, if you had to work with like a, a dealership or a finance office or like some procurement thing, um, you may not know the, you may have to work with four people at that company in order to get something done. And so those four people may need access to see other cases in their company, right? So. So like under their account, the, you may have multiple contacts. And so then they would essentially be able to see tickets from other contacts in their account. So that's kind of a, a, a big difference between your account structure than your, your consumer structure. Contacts are all about relationships within businesses and 
consumers are all about their individual household. Um, mm -hmm. The one thing to always note is some people get confused with this. When you create a contact, every contact has to have a parent account, but that contact can have relationships with multiple accounts. Right. But nice. yep. Yeah. Cool. Um, so that's kind of all I, all I could think of to think about when, I mean, there's more there. We didn't talk about households, but I think that's fine. Um, and, but I think from like a start, I think that if I would have known that before my first implementation, I think I would have been way better off. Um, I think the, the other tip that I like to give is, um, I don't like to use, uh, service nows completely out of the box roles. So like, for example, um, to not, it's not only, it's not enough to just create a, a consumer or a contact, you actually need to give them a role as well. Um, so like, for example, the role for consumer is, uh, like CSM consumer, just, I would star consumer it. Uh, no, I think it's, it's not CSM. It's just star consumer. I think it's SN. Yeah, it's like SN. Oh, oh, there we browser go. Browser crashes. And... I was wondering when that was going to happen. <laughs> Way to go, John. Way to go. Well, you know, I hear this from a number of people that both Chrome and Edge uh -huh. crash during uh, when you're doing stuff on lists. Interesting. Um, yeah, it's, well interesting is probably not the way i would say it but <laughs> is this why is this why john doesn't work in list views really at all i work so much in the portal space that this is usually not an issue but you can see that uh it does it does happen from time to time i mean it gave me time to to look into fixing our background for OPS. So. I'm happy, John. We're back. Okay, we were at rolls, right? Let's see if we can actually get in there and not have a problem. Because yeah, I so can't either. Consumer con. What is that? Consumer. Con there you go. <laughs> so yeah, so essentially, what you do is after you create your consumer user, you need to make sure that they have this role. Um, this is what actually grants them access to some most of the out of the box functionality to portals to to widgets to to cases etc so like make sure that um, you're giving them not only the role after you create the the correct user on the right table now I personally don't like to directly give them you know this role I like to create a custom role and then just put consumer underneath it and the only reason I like to do that, and it's really sad, and I hope ServiceNow fixes it, is because um, the the left hand side navigator. So, like in consumer, it doesn't work. But like if you think of like your agents, you can only restrict what they see on a on a role basis on the left hand navigator. And so, let's say you're you're onboarding internal agents um, that are consumer agents that are going to work on consumer tickets. They're going to be completely different than your ITSM folks, and you may have multiple organizations that may need tailored views for it. And so, the only reason I like to create a custom role to put underneath that is so that you can use it on the left hand side. Everywhere else, you don't need it because you can create, um, you know, user criterias. But like, just because if someone ever gets to this back end and they see this, I want to be able to, to control what they see. Um, but so random, that... random big plug here. When you're working with consumers, really think through your roles and registration process before you even start. Like mm -hmm. that is probably like the number one mistake I see people uh, make is either one, not build it to scale or to not think through their roles. And then they have a mess of, of what you're kind of talking about. Totally. Yeah. So, so that, that's kind of, you know, one thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, and there's a few roles, there's consumer roles, there's customer contact roles, there's agent roles, as you can see here. So there's a, there's a lot to unpack in CSM for roles. Like, and it, it makes sense if you have, 
you know, tier one support working with consumers, then they have consumer agent. If you have tier one support working with contacts, then they'll have the customer role. Um, and so you just kind of need to keep in mind and lay those out. They could have multiple roles if they're working with both contacts and consumers, but, you know, just kind of keep that in mind when, when you're trying to, to design this, you know, architecture um, in a scalable way. Um, I'm trying to think the other places, so other gotchas. Um, so you, when we turn on that security context plugin, um, if you want to go to widgets, John, since I know you love those, <laughs> um, you'll notice, and then can you show the roles uh, field? So if you are using user criteria for your service portal, uh, this may be different, but if you're not, Notice how some of these now have these internal and external. And so kind of keep in mind that if you have custom things, service now is not going to touch those widgets. <laughs> so if you have custom widgets and you want to, to make sure that people can still use and see them, you're going to need to make sure that they have the correct role. Um, and the other on one, the w widget, widget topic, the consumer portal and the part, um, business portal B2C are two separate portals um, out of box. So um, something to keep in mind and with with roles um, and your widgets. Yeah. And so these are just blanket external and internal to cover it. But you may want your widgets to be specific to those roles we were talking about, whether that was a custom role um, or whether that's like the consumer role or agent role. So you, you have that flexibility to, to change those roles on it. Um, the other place is, yeah, so it, I didn't install the, the customer service portal and the consumer portal. I think the customer what? service one's out of the box if you click on I it. I think forward slash CSM. Yeah, so CSM is installed, but the consumer one isn't installed by default. So just kind of keep that in mind if you wanted to use the out of the box. Um, a portal for consumers it doesn't actually get installed it's a plugin you have to enable um, but this is essentially what a a basic out-of-the-box portal looks like um, for a csm uh, user but note it's you may be seeing more than normal because we are an admin looking at this page so true enough, just, true enough. Um, so if you want to go back the other place that um is important for for portal people like John is pages. So very similar to uh, widgets, um, when you turn on CSM, pages are going to get roles as well. So you know if you if you turn it on and your portal stops working, <laughs> um, you may notice it's because of something like this. So again. It, you just want to do your due diligence, making sure that they have the right roles or because maybe you're giving too much access to things now where you didn't have that kind of access before. Um, I do want to give a shout out to the user criteria for service portal plugin um, because I hate using roles because it's out of date and I, I, want to, I want to say it's legacy. User criterias are the, the future. It's just not everywhere in the platform. But ServiceNow did uh, put a plugin out there for if you wanted to use user criteria instead of roles for your service portal. Um, I like that. User criteria is much more flexible mm -hmm. as far as, you know, granular allowances. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, yeah, I'm totally. used to it from the content delivery side. And as long as this plugin doesn't create a uh, number of caller restriction records <laughs> then i am all for it if it creates those records oh man how annoying does that get i can't make an edit without updating this record oh it's, yeah, well, that's it's... that's a whole other podcast you want to talk about pain <laughs> pain points of service now uh, oh it's so true so true <laughs> um yeah so that's that's kind of the, the gotchas that I have, pages, widgets, your users, your, your out-of-the-box roles, um, when, you, when you first turn it on. Um, we didn't really talk about transform maps or importing users, but if you do import users, make sure you're importing them to the correct table. 
um, make sure you're running the scripts to, to identify whether or not they are um, uh, a consumer or an, an agent. And um, that also brings me up to there's, if you, if you ever needed to start with CSM, use the guided setup. It's actually, they've done a lot of work on it. So if you wanna to go to that one, John, there is a guided setup for CSM. And even if you don't um, like actually go through the guided setup and mark everything complete, um, utilize it at least for, uh, did I do everything I need to do? Because for example, they have scripts in here that help you if, let's say you had customer information or customer accounts already in the system before you've turned it on. Let's say you're using it with ITSM, you have vendors or something. Um, then they have a script here that allows you to run to go and find those and tag them and then convert them to have the right roles. So if you don't wanna to have to write all the converting of users to contacts or consumers, uh, they do have a guided setup here um, that helps you with that. Yeah, and I think a big takeaway here to kind of bring it all the way back is if you don't have the right person or group, you know, the, the SA or the business analyst or whoever you're using, knowing what they're, what you need to do to get all this running, you're going to have problems, you know. As we talk about consulting from our point of view, you know, that's where Brian comes into play on the projects and he has his team that know um, the questions to ask to, to go through this, even with the guided setup. Um, mm -hmm. So this is your, you know, day-to-day -day type, type activities for Brian. But uh, for those out there that want to use CSM, just really understand what you're getting into and who you should talk to. <laughs> <laughs> to, to plan out this, you know, a project like this, this is not a small undertaking, you know, this is mm -hmm. not a port just, you know, this is not just a portal. This is not just uh, uh, a CSM quick thing. This is from, from what I see, this is huge. You know, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that you want to understand. And one thing, to keep in mind too it's like to john's point it it is a it is a thing it it it's a not it's not like i do itsm oh i'm going to do a couple little things in csm the right. biggest thing about csm is business process and you can implement the tool but you we spend more time on business process than csm more than the itsm side because um, ITSM gets to follow a framework of ITIL, right? Most people follow mm -hmm. that framework. CSM is a completely different set of users, a completely different workflow, and you're really trying to get to different outcomes. Um, Let me ask you this, Brian. Do you ever see um, where companies are entrenched in their processes and then this comes along and they're resistant to change their process to how do you phrase it to uh um make things more efficient or to 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 use better processes i guess that this would this would bring about well people never like change um <laughs> but um i think the hardest thing we have um normally is getting people to a baseline because um, we actually see a lot of customers go from Excel spreadsheets to CSM. Yeah. And wow. that's a jump. Yeah. And, <laughs> it's got to be huge. <laughs> and then the second thing is <clears throat> I always tell people it's a journey. It's not, it's not a one-stop shop because I've seen people spend, there's ServiceNow customers that spend $50 million a, a year in development of the CSM tool. And mm -hmm. Um, it, it's a thing. And if you build a good core integration, start automating stuff, you can, um, start integrating with your telephone systems. You can do the sky's the limit and that's when it gets fun, but, um, changing to get your baseline process down it is, is a difficult thing to do for a lot of people. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've, I've seen it in different, like back when I was doing, you know, sysadmin type work and stuff like that business groups were very resistant to process change, especially when you could, you know, um, alleviate a lot of pain points. They still were like, no, we like the way we're doing it. And you're like, okay, but this makes it much more efficient and helps <laughs> move the work along. I would say the top three excuses are one, I don't want to. <laughs> Two, they, they use audit as their scapegoat which most of the time is not an issue. And then three, they use some regulation, regulatory compliance thing to, to call it out saying we have to do it this way. And most of the time it ends up being more secure, more compliant and more efficient, but you got to get there. Yeah. yeah. I, I love the excuse. I, I think I was on a call with a client. They were like, well, email is working fine for us. Like we're, we're a help desk and email works fine for us. And I was just like, yeah, it probably, it probably works fine. Um, but like, oh, I know the yeah, groups that yeah. work out of email, you're just like, how are you doing that still? You know, yeah. you see them like, oh, well, we have this whole thread going and you're like, what, well, how do you expose visibility to your end user? Like, you know, I worked for a company at one point, I would send in a reimbursement, right? That was it. Black hole. That was, yeah. that was my totally. visibility was sending the email in. That was it. I could never find out. I'd have to email them and be like, Hey, where's, where am I at in the process? And they'd be like, Oh, we'll get back to you. And by the time they get back to you, it was the final, Oh, here's your check. And you're like, yeah. yeah. I, can I think, we have a little, can we do tickets or something where I can see that someone's working on stuff, you know? I, I think I think the one thing too is people the the level of expectations of users th these days has continued to grow, um, mm. and everyone wants visibility into yeah. what they're doing. If I have to cancel my airline ticket, I'm going to be using virtual chat, and they're going to auto cancel it for me now. And um, um, some of them are using ServiceNow to do that, and um, I think. IT, you get away with it sometimes. Like people have the the um, experience of the IT help desk um, <laughs> mentality, and they're like, "Oh, I got a ticket number. I'm just gonna keep emailing this person until he answers me." But like, customer service is really about good customer relations to make your customers your advocates, and that's done through the technology. And um, I think that's the biggest thing that takeaway that people need to know when they're jumping into CSM, like you're exposing yourself to your customers. And if you get it wrong, they're going to know. Yeah. But if you get it right, they're going to know too. Yeah. And, you know, I, I can even give an example just recently, just yesterday, I needed to cancel an order because I got a phone call. They said, oh, it's going to be back ordered till September. And I'm like, okay, I'll just cancel the order. So this is a huge company. This isn't some small mom and pop shop. This is very large warehouse company. Okay. I, I won't say the name anyways. Um, <laughs> so I, I go into my account and I click cancel order. What I get is, um, yeah, we'll try to cancel it, but, uh, if we can't and it shows up, just don't accept it. Don't accept the the item. Just make them take it back and then start a a return process. And I was like, this is the worst. <laughs> this is a terrible experience for canceling an item. Or other companies, you, you you cancel it, yeah, and you get all these emails saying we've canceled it. Don't you know it's not coming? Your refund is being processed. And I get you know I get insight to what's happening. This one, no insight. Just we'll try. And that's the best we can do, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. Like, even from, like, I, f I feel like nowadays I think about, like, hey, if I'm going to shop at Costco, like, I know they'll, they'll take at back anything. Like, and that drives me to want to shop at Costco. But, like, if you try to go to Best Buy, they may have some crazy return policy with these, like, little dots on it that say you can't return this and unless it's 14 days or unpackaged and and like now i'm thinking like 
there's value that they're uh, in good customer support, right? If the service may be great, but like, especially let's say finance, like, oh my gosh, if you ever had to try to talk to a bank or, you know, your phone service, like, and they have terrible customer support, you're like, this is my money. Like, how do I get my money back? Right. And, yeah. um, so, so that kind of stuff is like, like in drilled in my head now of like, it's not just the service that needs to like the, the product that needs to be good. I need to, if I have a problem with the product, good support. Right. Well, I, I think there's an, another component there or con, component, it, you know, it's the enablement of the service agent. Mm -hmm. So going back to, you know, the, the returns, I, I don't necessarily want to talk to someone in person. I find that to be slow and not conducive to a good experience. I like the virtual chat or the mm -hmm. virtual agent. Even, and, and even if it's a live person, I, that's fine too. I, I just don't want to be on the phone waiting and sitting there right so if you know if if they are enabled to <clears throat> do those things for you you know i want to return this item or i want to get a price match or whatever um when they're enabled to make those decisions without having to do other things it's quick and easy i get my stuff done and you know a lot of people come down on comcast for whatever i find their service to be excellent every time i've gotten mm -hmm through on their chat to get something done, it gets done and I'm, I'm happy, you know, mm -hmm. but I've had other chats with other larger companies that I won't name <laughs> that, you know, you're sitting there waiting for them to go talk to someone or they just can't process what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so if CSM is, is, got the components to do the enablement, you know, through the virtual chat or however, because I've seen some of our implementations of virtual chat and you can, I mean, you can do all the levels there and it's, it's quite phenomenal. Um, but I think it adds to, you know, it's just another component to have that great experience with the, um, the company, you know, that you, you, Brian, you talk about exposure and opening up and in an insight. That's just another component of that is having, the ability to enable your agents to take care of the problem, thus giving out that good service. You know, it's even yeah. better letting people fix their own problems <laughs> or fixing it before you even know about it. What's better than right. getting an email from your internet provider saying, we already know that, that it's down. We're working to fix it. Right. And proactive and like that's, CSM. Yeah. Proactive. <laughs> yes. It, it, it's, it's a feature in service now. Right. So like even John, you mentioned too, like playbooks is something that came to mind, like enabling agents, right. To know the process and understand it. You could use playbooks in CSM, your virtual agents, you can create topics that navigate for, for things, um, you to, to direct you to the right person. You could do self-help in virtual agents so that they're like essentially filling out catalog items for themselves and then those get submitted. Um, so we didn't talk about it all, right? But like you, you can even have special case types um, that you know have specific processes that you, that those follow. Um, so there's there's a lot to unpack in CSM, which is you yeah. know beautiful, but it can be daunting too. So just kind of keep in mind. Do you remember back in the day when they first enabled, um, it was on IT tickets or on tickets or whatever, and they enabled the, the, the knowledge base. So you type in your, your issue on the ticket and then it, you would get a list of knowledge base articles. Yeah. The search ahead. Yeah. Yeah. That was like huge with service now <laughs> because it re it would reduce your, your, uh, help desk tickets. Mm -hmm. because people could do self-help they would get a, yeah. they would get knowledge articles that might reference what they were trying to fix and it, it, yeah the the progress the progress we've seen or i've seen anyways whatever within how service now is doing things you know it, it's just phenomenal over the years on how and, and i think you mentioned this dorian with the expectations of the end user mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know now i expect to to get stuff like that or to get through faster and easier and just makes experiences better. 
Totally. So let's let's stop screen share. We're just about at time. If you if you do have CSM questions, feel free to, to reach out to us. You know, we're we're happy to talk through whether it's we're building it or just consulting on it. You know, we, we do have a plethora of knowledge. Yeah, um, we, have, we didn't talk we about leads everything. Like Brian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, and if you like this content, you know, feel free to subscribe. We normally we normally do them live, but this time we we couldn't. Um, but you know, you know, thanks again. So. <laughs> You'll always be kept up to date on new content, though, if you do subscribe, mm, whether it's live go. or recorded. Yeah, we'll, we'll where, where's our client? Where, where's our canned laughter and clapping? That's what we need. <laughs> oh, my gosh, you're, you're, you're asking too much for me.